Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 47, Be My Secret Heretic, with Hannah Dean. I'm Mark Cain. First, and this will only make sense later, Hannah has actually received her diploma in the mail. Ah. This whole effort of the UCA, it's unique and a bit strange, but also wonderful. It's not like we're just following a pattern and everything is laid out according to some plan. We're testing the waters, trying things, shifting, and learning. It's really no surprise. The UCA is a single-issue advocacy group, and that's not normal for religious groups. Normally, they lay out all the required teachings which qualify you for admittance. Not in this case, and that's very deliberate. It's a unique effort. That's about all I'll say now, but please check out episode number one, The Perilous Trinity Deep Dive, to get a feel for why we exist, and then number 39, Reflections and Purpose, to hear more about how odd and sometimes challenging this effort can be. But at the core, we are people who believe that God is one in the strict sense, not in the you can have one crowd at the Super Bowl, which is actually over 70,000 people. You know, one has a special compound unity significance. No, for us, that crowd is actually one crowd. And one actually means one. Our God is one, and our Lord is one. He's God's Son. He is subject to the Father. He obeys His Father. He loves His Father. He receives authority from His Father. He was anointed as king by his father, and the list can go on and on. We understand this kind of language as plain and obvious. If God gives Jesus authority, then Jesus didn't have authority. If God gives Jesus the words to speak, then Jesus wasn't already in possession of those words. While to some this may seem a devious and misleading falsehood, as it turns out, it's simply based on basic human language. Some of us were born into groups where God's simple and amazing unity was taught from the start. But many, very many, in fact, had to discover this the hard way. They had to ask questions when it wasn't the congenial thing to do. They had to basically turn against their own well-rehearsed and entrenched framework and acknowledge that parts of it could be wrong. These people in their sincere pursuit of what the New Testament authors were trying to convey to us, these people are often rebuked and dismissed from Christian circles. I find that very sad, especially because, in almost every case, those who are doing the dismissing did not take the time to learn what they were dismissing. You may be a Trinitarian college graduate with a theology degree, here you are listening to me talk about something which seems perhaps plausible. You may be thinking, but how could this be a reasonable interpretation when it never came up at seminary? Great question. I want you to think about that. Mull over the possibilities on your own. But this much is likely true. You weren't given the entire story. You were given a story, yes, that everyone from the start basically had a Trinitarian or Proto-Trinitarian or Early Trinitarian or whatever Trinitarian perspective. They simply and merely held off describing it until some heretic got too loud. Hundreds of years later. <laughs> well, if that's the story you know and love, and if you're feeling a bit rebellious, dig around for the earliest groups closest to the apostles, closest in time and in proximity, the Jewish believers in the Messiah. These, I would argue, were the earliest pockets of believers. If they weren't Trinitarian, and in fact, if they were very non-Trinitarian, wouldn't that be a remarkable discovery? It would be. The UCA recognizes that something is woefully lacking in Christendom. By amassing participation and people from around the globe on this single point, we intend to turn the tide and restore this simple 
and earliest theological idea back to its former place. We believe it's worth it. We believe there was a reason that the Shema was given to be spoken day and night. It's because of its remarkable truth. We believe the unity of God and the amazing reality of His now-exalted human Son, that this presents us with a faith we can understand, a Lord we can literally model, and the comfort of a sympathetic high priest continually in the presence of His God, interceding on our behalf and pouring out His Spirit, empowering us to live as He did. That's not a theological puzzle repackaged and excused as an amazingly profound spiritual mystery. That's simply New Testament teaching, simple enough for common folk to make sense of. I actually believe the Trinitarian castle has already crumbled to the point that it should be abandoned. Even the Trinitarian apologists bemoan the sad state of affairs. The pastors often avoid it entirely. And the congregants, if asked to explain their views, are usually heretics. The castle is not safe for human dwelling, but the people who live there are refusing to move out. What an awful place to put your students. Demand a doctrine that they can't understand, one that wasn't important enough for anyone in the Bible to mention, and then tell them any deviation from it or questioning of it, leads to damnation. Hannah made it through Cedarville University, a private Baptist college in southwest Ohio. She got her bachelor's degree and a wealth of experiences. Now, still in the early stages of her life, she takes a few minutes to reflect on these moments with us. Hannah Dean, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. You've been preparing for four years for this interview. You didn't even know you were. (laughs) Oh, actually three and a half, but yes. (laughs) Okay. Technically, you've only been preparing for this interview since we met at the 20s and 30s conference and we're talking about it. Technically. Yes. (laughs) So at that time, I didn't realize you were attending Cedarville. Why don't you explain that real quick so that people understand? Yeah. So it is a Christian college. It's accredited. It's in Ohio. Technically, they say they're non-denominational, but they are heavily Baptist. So at the college, you're required to not only take your your major specific classes, but each student is required to take a Bible minor, which consists of about 15 credit hours worth of work, Okay, which is Trinitarian in nature. But yeah. (laughs) Yes. So when we were talking about this at the 20s and 30s conference in Tennessee back in June— I, well, we just started chatting about your experiences at the college, and I was excited about it, of course. <laughs> oh, well, I was saying that I couldn't quite do it yet, so I wanted to get my degree and make sure that they couldn't kick me out uh, <laughs> before I did this. <laughs> so I had to put on the calendar, wait until December or January, and make sure you got your degree. So you graduated <laughs> then just in December, I guess, right? Yeah, that's right. Very recent. And it's official, right? I'm not going to get you in trouble? It, it is technically official, although they haven't given me my diploma yet. So I'm still waiting on that in the mail. Hopefully soon. <laughs> well, let's go back in time. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your upbringing. Yeah. So, you know, I grew up as a, a farm girl slash pastor's kid in Ohio living in the cornfields. <laughs> so my dad is a pastor. He still is a pastor, you know, part of the Church of God General Conference Denominations, which is Unitarian. Mm-hmm. So I grew up in that, and yeah. Well, in that regard, you and I are very similar. We're both sons or daughters of pastors in the Church of God General Conference. Yeah. We've heard good theology from the time we were old enough to comprehend language. We had no choice. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Our fathers put it into our heads. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The first time I ever really, like, realized what the Trinity was, I think I was, like, five to seven, and we had Wednesday night church services at our church, and people and kids from the community would come. Mm -hmm. And there was one little girl there that came. She was my age, and she was in classes with me, but her name was Trinity. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I didn't really realize what it was. So, like, I thought, you know, as a kid, like, oh, yeah, that's a pretty cool name. And um, and I was telling my parents that, and they're like, you know, well, actually, you might not want to use that name. And I was like, why? What's wrong with that? And they're like, well— And they explained it to me. And, you know, as a kid, I just remember thinking, like, what? 
That's funny. What did <laughs> did she continue attending? I think that would be just fantastic. That would be very interesting. <laughs> I know. I think she quit attending after a little while, you know. Okay. But <laughs> well, you know it would be really handy. If anybody is out there who knows a Unitarian whose name is Trinity, I want to do that interview. Contact me, podcast <laughs> at UnitarianChristianAlliance.org. Okay. Got that little plug. <laughs> I had to put the plug in. Now, this is the part that's fascinating to me. You're getting into high school and you're starting to make college plans because, of course, you're Unitarian Christian. I'd like to understand what sort of thinking you were going through to pick a college at that time. You know, in high school, I didn't really know what exactly I was going to do with my life yet or where to go. So it was that confusing crossroads that we all go through. Mm -hmm. So my dad and I went to a um, like a conference there. At Cedarville? Yes. Yeah, okay. it was like Ken Ham for like creationism. Oh, okay. And it was free. So we went there and we sat in on the seminars. Of course, the school was advertising everything they had to offer. <laughs> right. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> through the state of Ohio, you can get free college classes when you're in high school. Oh. So I just kind of started doing it through them. So I was kind of already familiar with that school. There was a few others I considered, but I like Cedarville because it was kind of close to home, but it wasn't like super close either. So I could still, you know, have independence and live at the, the, the college, but still, you know, come home if I needed to. Yeah. Um, like you graduate from high school with credits already in college, right? Yeah, that's right. That's why I was able to graduate from Cedarville in three and a half years opposed to four because I had a semester out of the way. Ah, that's, that's a six month advance on this interview then. Exactly. I planned it just for this. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now, Hannah, so here you are planning that Cedarville would be a choice. Mm -hmm. Yet you had to process the potential of what could go down, given that you were clearly theologically <laughs> divergent from the school. Yeah. Actually, when I was first kind of considering that, that was something that, you know, I was a little bit leery about. A lot of places, you know, you look into, they make you sign a doctrinal statement before mm. you enter, which obviously at a Trinitarian university, I couldn't really sign a doctrinal statement. Yeah. But luckily at this college, they didn't require that to just be a student. Hmm. With them requiring Bible classes, I had to think about, like, I had to be sure that I knew what I believed. Mm -hmm. Thinking also to, like, friends and conversations, I knew I wouldn't be able to speak as openly about my theology. But in some ways, it was better doing that, in my mind, than going to a college that might try to indoctrinate me in other ways. Hmm. I wanted to go to a college that did put God first. And although they were Trinitarian, they did have chapel services every week where, you know, they did worship songs. They had a strong emphasis on helping people and just ministering to people. And I really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. And just the fact that there'd be lots of students that our moral compasses would align a little bit more together. Mm, yeah. I had been to camps and stuff where the theology was different. So I felt pretty confident in that, which I think helped me in that decision as well. Camps. This was experienced before you went to Cedarville? Yeah. It's actually a horse camp out west that I went to as a camper. And that was one that we did a little bit more preparation for because I was younger then. I think I was 15 or 16 the first time I went out. And that was probably the real first, um, I guess, exposure I had to like a pretty main Trinitarian world. The people that run it are, are very sweet people, but they're very strong Southern Baptist. So the Trinity doctrine, all of that is very, very prevalent in what they teach. Yeah. So you prepped to be a doctrinal misfit at the age of like 16 <laughs> before you went out to horse camp. Is that what, am I understanding you correctly? <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, I kind of had to do that to figure out like, oh, this is what they're going to be telling me. And like, you know, I got to be ready. So okay. it gave me that exposure that I need to be able to know like, what was going to hit me when I went to a Trinitarian university. <laughs> okay, okay. So you felt prepared to go to college, but did you have a plan in your mind what you would do? Like, had you gone through the scenarios like, well, okay, if a teacher asks me to write a paper on the Trinity or what do I do with the, my roommate? I mean, mm -hmm. had you played out some scenarios and even made decisions ahead of time? Um, a little bit. So I am a classic overthinker. So I went through all these hypothetical situations in my head. <laughs> oh, what if the professor like asked me to defend the Trinity or, you know, there's some sort of conversation in class because I did have to sign the student covenant saying that I would respect the opinions of others. And like in classes, even if I disagree with what the professors were saying, mm. that was something in the preparation process. Like, how am I going to do that? But also not blindly going along and just accepting everything that's thrown at me. Yeah. For instance, there was one time in a friend group text message chain 
someone would send out little random devotionals or something. Okay. One of the messages that got sent one time was about temptation. And he used like how, you know, Christ understands our temptations and because he's God, like God can, you know, understand that too. Rather than just being like, oh, no, you're wrong about this. I just put, well, what about the verse in James that says that God can't be tempted? The person messaged back and was like, oh, well, I didn't really take into consideration this and this and this. And then he said, but in the end, it's a divine mystery. (laughs) So that was the response. Yes. Getting them to question it without it being my idea that they should question it. I see. Just (laughs) just throwing things out and letting them go where they may. Yeah, exactly. Um, But I honestly don't think I put too much thought into the roommate thing going in. I mean, it feels like so long ago now. With my second roommate, her and I actually had more discussions about it um, because she herself was actually um, a oneness believer, which also didn't go at the college. Right. We had a lot of really good conversations, but they were all in secret. So, (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, just kind of navigating as it came, I guess, because I couldn't fully predict what was going to happen. So just being open to any possibility. Okay. I'm intrigued now that you had a oneness roommate and you were both uh, having clandestine theological conversations. <laughs> yeah. Um, she was very interested in theology, so she always brought up those type of topics as well. Mm. You know, I kind of explained to her one day, I believe that, you know, Jesus is God's son and that there's one God. And she kind of explained to me, you know, what she believed with the oneness background. So we had lots of conversations either in our dorm room talking like that, or sometimes it'd be in the dining hall in hushed tones, <laughs> hopefully no one hearing. <laughs> because I had been in it for a while, she asked me a lot of questions about like, well, how did you deal with this and this? And like, even praying in public, I helped her navigate being the odd man out. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Did she ever change your mind? Um, Not yet, I don't think. She was very interested in finding out more. She had a lot of questions for me that I tried to answer, and I'd ask her questions. Hmm. We had Bible studies together and stuff, too, which was really cool. Oh, that is cool. Yeah. So I'm guessing you had yourself a nice share of awkward and unique (laughs) events, because when we talked back in June, (laughs) I could see it in your face that you had plenty that you could tell, but we just had to wait. I know people listening to this might be considering going to a college like this. These stories might be the very things that help plan in advance what might go down. Yeah. So my first semester there, I didn't have to take any Bible classes. My first experiences was just hearing the conversations around me of other students talking about it. And I learned that heresy is a very popular and very favorite word and topic. Like how favorite? Like, you know, like every day at meals or? I... I probably heard the word heresy, whether it was like in jest or whether it was real conversations. I probably heard that word at least once a day, oh. probably more. <laughs> um, there's a video that all of them liked. It's like St. Patrick heresy or something like that. But it's these two little um, Irish guys yeah. talking to yeah. St. Patrick. Yeah, <laughs> that's where he goes, that's modalism, Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that one. It's really funny. Yeah, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> there is even a book that went around at Cedarville a lot. One of the professors or something had written a book where he took popular superheroes, like the Green Lantern and a couple others, and he compared them to different heresies. <laughs> so that always sounded interesting. Uh-huh. Um, but that was a required textbook for some of the classes. Oh. Yeah. And then, you know, even in chapel services, they'd be talking and they'd say, someone doesn't believe that Jesus is God. They're a false teacher. They're a heretic. They're going to burn forever in hell. You know, kind of when I first started hearing those things at first, I'd be like, oh, but kind of the more I hear it, I had to kind of keep from from chuckling out loud because like, oh boy, if they only knew who was sitting right next to them. <laughs> so that was always kind of funny. The first experience was the first class I had on the Bible, which was called Bible and the Gospel. Mm -hmm. That class, he talked a lot about like the Trinity and stuff and how you could technically see it in the Bible or whatever. I think the thing that really opened my eyes that I did believe differently than all of them was he asked the class if any of them would serve with someone who believed differently, and then he— like Somebody who would who would serve with, like in a church situation? Is that yeah, what? so he gave the example of if there was a homeless shelter and some churches wanted to, like, team up, would you serve with people from a church that, like— And he gave the, for instance, of not believing that Jesus was God. Mm. 
there was a couple people that said that they would, but most of the class was like, oh no, because they're not real Christians and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think that was the first time that freshman year that I was kind of like, you know, a little bit, I guess, isolated. That was the first feelings I had of that at that college. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm still fascinated that heresy was such a big deal. But then, you know, <laughs> cult hunters or heresy hunters, there are groups that make it their mission to root out the lies and the falsehoods around us. So mm-hmm. did, was was one of the superheroes Unitarian? I never read the book, oh. so I'm not really sure. But that was actually the interesting thing. They never specifically mentioned Unitarianism like really dug down and like, oh, this is why they believed that. They just kind of danced around it. It was like, oh, that's a heresy. And then they moved on. Okay. So you never got to sit through a discussion of what is a biblical Unitarian? No. In fact, the word Unitarian only came up once in one of my textbooks, but it's associated more with like the universalism rather than, you know, actual biblical Unitarianism. I would have thought that there would have been more about that, but there wasn't. Yeah. I hear this from a lot of folks, and you'll hear them on the Mm -hmm. podcast who were like, I never even knew that was an option. You can apparently get through a seminary, maybe even a master's or who knows, a doctorate in some places, and never really understand this particular perspective. Mm -hmm. Just miss it entirely. We'll spend all of our time working out some finer detail in the uh, hypostatic union for our PhD. And then when we're done, one day we discover the UCA. I'm like, what are they talking about? I've (laughs) never heard this and I'm a PhD. So it's obviously not real. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. All right. Well, I guess it hasn't changed too much. Yeah. um, So another thing that kind of happened early on is there was a editor that used to work with the NIV New International Version. He used to do like some translation work. Mm -hmm. He did some sort of seminar at my university on like, can the modern translations of the Bible be fully trusted? Mm. So I thought, you know, I'll just go and see what he has to say. And he was talking and he there was one verse and he said that this verse, which a lot of people go to, you know, for the Trinity and stuff, isn't found in some earlier translations. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. That might be kind of like a gateway to ask a question. And of course, I was still kind of new at the college. I was very nervous to ask this question. And when it came time to ask, I was like, so you mentioned this first. And I was just wondering, has that changed the way that you would talk to someone about how you would find the Trinity in the Bible? And he said that actually, you know what, there's no one verse in the Bible that we can point to that proves the Trinity. It's more of a concept that we have to see in the entire Bible. (laughs) So just having someone that was heavily Trinitarian admit that was just very interesting, especially, you know, in a classroom full of scholars and stuff. Yeah. (laughs) I remember my heart was racing like, oh, no, are they all going to know? But they didn't. So that was good, I guess. (laughs) Interesting. All right. Yeah. And so this other time, too, I had a class and it was one of my theology classes. It finally came time for those. And those were the classes that I was the most worried for. There was theology one and theology two. How many years into school are you before you get to your theology classes? That was this past spring. So like kind of the very end. Okay. So you're like a junior. Yes, a junior and then a senior. All right. So those classes I was worried about probably the most because you have to write theology papers. Mm. Navigating that was fun. Um, (laughs) And then in one of them, I had to read a book called Delighting in the Trinity, which was not a delight. Um, (laughs) So that book got very marked up and I could never resell that one at that college. (laughs) So (laughs) lots of highlighting and notes on the margins. Would you be willing to submit it to the Unitarian Christian Museum? perhaps. Oh, now that I might have to think about. (laughs) We could keep it under glass. (laughs) Yes, it was theology one, and it was probably the most controversial class for me that I took while at Cedarville. So we were talking about heresies and stuff because we reached that module of the semester, Mm -hmm. which, you know, I was just jumping for joy at. You were like, finally, we get to talk about heresies. It's it's been like silent for three years. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) But we were talking about the Council of Nicaea and, you know, it came time to talk about Arius. And it was a painting that he had found from way back in the day that, you know, was a scene of what was happening there. All of the people that defended the position of what would become the Trinity and stuff. And then Arius is underneath their feet. Mm. The professor said, you know, kind of joke about it, but also, you know, anyone who doesn't accept the Trinity does belong underneath our feet. (laughs) And I I was like, holy cow, like what on earth are you saying? So that was interesting. But (laughs) Hmm. you mentioned that you didn't have a statement of faith that you had to sign. 
had you opportunities to do ministry work where this came back up again and became a problem? Unfortunately, yes. To be a student, I didn't have to sign a doctrinal statement. To be part of student organizations like the news organization or something like that, I didn't have to sign anything. But anything relating to ministry, like prison ministries, they had children ministries and, you know, global mission trips that they went on. In order to apply for those and to be accepted into those programs, I had to fill out an application. And on that application was a little box that said, by submitting this application, I agree to and accept Cedarville University's doctrinal statement. Oh. So that excluded me from a lot of those things. I mean, I could have just signed it, but that would have been lying and agreeing to something that I didn't agree with. Yep. So I was still able to do ministry, but I had to do it outside of the college. Now, did any of your fellow students ask you like, hey, Hannah, I noticed you haven't done one of these yet. What, what's the deal? I mean, people would talk to me about like, oh, this is really fun. Like you should try it out sometime. I'd be like, oh, that's interesting. Um, but it, It's a small enough school where rumors do go around. (laughs) So, Mm. I guess we should have mentioned this, but how big is the school? It's slightly under 4,000. Okay. One other tidbit of information, when you're looking for like internships and stuff at college, if you want to do ministry opportunities, if you have the option to apply for something and still not sign the doctrinal statement, don't be afraid to do that because I was able to do an internship with a missionary company to do journalism and stuff with. And one of the requirements is that you had to sign a doctrinal statement, but I put on the doctrinal statement, no, I can't agree with this. And they still accepted me into the program. Ah. So don't Ah. be afraid to try it out because the worst they can say is no. So, but this organization wasn't part of the college. It wasn't, no. Okay. So it's not like you were telling the college, hey, I'm not agreeing with you. You were telling just some separate third-party organization, I'd like to join you, but I can't agree with this. Yeah. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, okay. So there were things that you couldn't do and And you would have wanted to participate in some regard. But how about like any fun stories maybe? (laughs) Yeah, I kind of thought of myself as an espionage um, on that type of mission because, you know, I was breaking through their ranks. You know, I was a secret heretic or secret Unitarian that nobody knew about when I was discovering all of their secrets. (laughs) It was a fun way to think about it for me. One of the times that that came to a head, one of my friends, we were in the theology class. And we sat right next to each other. And it was right after the section where we're talking about heresies and stuff. And we had hypothetical conversations all the time, too. But she didn't really know what I believed. She turned to me and she said, you know, like, Hannah, I need to talk to more heretics. And I was like, oh, yeah, that would be interesting. (laughs) She's like, yeah, you know what? I think you should be my secret heretic. And I was like, yeah, I would love to be that for you. So so you— Okay, wait a minute. You were you were playing like a Trinitarian, like a Unitarian, sort of. I, I mean, mm-hmm. was it a class assignment or what? It was just a random conversation that her and I had where she said, if I ever wanted a heretic, like, I would want you to be my secret heretic. Aww. So it was just— <laughs> That's so sweet. It is, yeah. <laughs> you should maybe get a t-shirt that says, I'm your secret heretic. Maybe I should. <laughs> a conversation starter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's very cool. So you made it through. In hindsight, Mm -hmm. are there things that you might have done differently, things that you would change? I am pretty satisfied with it. When I first started out, I was a little bit more scared and a little bit more uncomfortable just because of the fact of not getting kicked out. But as I got further along in my career, I became more comfortable not only with what I believe, but I became more confident in what I believed because I learned the Trinitarian theology or the Baptist theology inside and out. So I kind of feel like I'm almost bilingual. I can understand what they're saying so that when I talk to people now, I know exactly what angle to come from. And I know what they're going to say. I know what arguments they're going to go to. Mm. In that way, it made me stronger in the theology that I grew up in. Ah. And then I was able to get more bold, like with the theology papers. I had to write papers on the doctrine of God and on the doctrine of Christ. I just strictly used the Bible, and I didn't use any of the extra things that they had told me, and I still passed all the papers, and I got really good marks from the professors. When I had to write the book review on the Delighting in the Trinity, I basically said he just used church fathers and history and stuff rather than actually using the Bible, and I would have rather have seen biblical integration for something that you're claiming to be biblical. And my professor just put, you know, fair, dot, dot, dot. (laughs) Fair. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There were times that I thought that I can't do this anymore. Being isolated and not being able to participate in the same way that other people did, that did get difficult at times. 
and hearing them talk about people who believe differently and just hearing the disregard in their voices sometimes and just wondering, you know, like, would these people actually be my friends still if they knew what I believed? That isolation factor is definitely something that you have to struggle with. But there are people that, you know, like my roommate that I was able to confide in. You can't trust everybody with it. Mm -hmm. Um, If your goal is to get a degree, I mean, if you're... (laughs) goal is to stir stuff up, you could definitely go for it. But if <laughs> you want to get a degree and you want to pass and stuff, you know, find people to confide in that you trust. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good bit of advice right there. <laughs> I'm thankful for the time that I had there. And I think that it went over, it went over well. So very good. Yes. In your honest opinion, if you had come straight out, raised your hand in a classroom in your theology 101 class, whatever it was, and said, I disagree I believe Jesus was a man and God was the one person called the father. I think you're all wrong. Mm -hmm. Would you have been able to stay at that college? You know, that's a really great question. Specifically in the student conduct thing, you're not supposed to do that. Ah, There's one professor I had that I was able to talk a little bit more freely with about like some other topics. He invited people to represent their views. Mm. But then there were others that were very, very strict on that. So it's a possibility I could have gotten away with it, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, that (laughs) conduct, if you agreed to not do that and then you went Mm. and did it, they could hold that against you and say, well, you're not welcome here any longer. Yeah. It wouldn't be the first time a Baptist has asked a Unitarian to depart. Let's just say that. (laughs) (laughs) If you were to meet somebody else who's thinking about going to a college like this, I mean, there are a few. I I think of like Liberty is one in the same category as Cedarville. Mm -hmm. There's some on the West Coast, too, I think. Yeah. So if you had somebody who was thinking about attending one of these colleges, what kind of advice would you give them? Yeah, I would definitely say that there's going to be a lot of challenges in it, but it's also going to be really good. At that college, I made some really, really great friendships that I'm very thankful for. A lot of my friends there helped me through difficult times. So just because you might believe differently from them doesn't mean that you can't be friends and that you can't have conversations. A lot of them have really open hearts and, you know, they're very passionate. You see a lot of crazy stuff happening at some secular colleges. Being able to be in an environment where people's moral compasses align up a little bit better with yours (laughs) is definitely a plus. And then you know, your faith can be challenged, you know, your doctrines can be challenged. It really depends on who you are as a person. And if you feel strong and you're up for that challenge, it can really strengthen those doctrines that you might already have. And also too, it gives you a place not to be in an echo chamber Mm. so that you can hear other opinions and actually really strengthen your faith in that area. Suppose somebody wanted to challenge you, like, is just terrible. Hannah, to not open your mouth at every opportunity Mm -hmm. about the truth. Uh, How could you live with yourself? You know, maybe they would go that far. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've had to deal with that, or maybe you thought about that. I'm curious what you think. Yeah, um, there are definitely times where I feel like I could have been more bold and maybe I could have opened my mouth more. But also, too, I think when you take the time to gain someone's respect, they might be more apt to listen to you. Because even like with my last roommate, If I had just kind of jumped on her and started telling her that stuff, I don't think a lot of the Bible and the theological conversations we would have had may have been there in the same way. Mm -hmm. That's even one thing that she said to me that I thought was interesting. And she said, you know, I've been told my whole life that if someone doesn't believe exactly like I do, they're not saved. But I see the fruit of the Spirit in you, and I see Christ working through you. Mm. For her to be able to make that connection was something that happened over time. Mm. That, That criticism come out from among them, and yet here you are taking classes among them. You had to come to grips with that and look at your overall objective, which in this case was a degree you wanted to get through your schooling. Um, I guess sometimes we can look at people that have different opinions as us as the enemy. But being in a college where I saw that theology played out, a lot of those people are scared. And especially a lot of like the friends and stuff I made connections with, you know, they're really good people. Mm -hmm. In a way, I feel sad for them because They have grown up in a situation where the only thing they can believe is that Jesus is God and believe in the Trinity. And if they are to even doubt that, they might face persecution or they're not real Christians. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been a real real culture of seeking the truth in areas that it might seem a little bit questionable. Mm. Did you ever get like a firsthand experience of somebody 
admitting that kind of fear? Yeah. Um, me and some friends were sitting at a table and this random guy came through that has been a pastor for a few years and he was at the bookstore and he just started talking to us about theology. Hmm. And then the church fathers came up and he started talking about how none of them were actually Trinitarian. Oh. That was really interesting. So I started engaging him in conversation and, you know, asking him about stuff. And then when he left, a lot of my friends were talking huh, like I didn't really realize any of that stuff. And I was like, yeah, there's actually huge groups of people, <laughs> you know, that don't believe in this. I'm guessing then they didn't want to pursue it too much. No. This was not something that they were free to explore. I even had one friend when he started talking about the Trinity that just had to walk away. They couldn't take going down into that conversation because to them, it's blasphemy to even consider that. So this guy coming through pushed the buttons and he had to just leave. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. If you've been convinced of something, you're kind of stuck in that mindset. Well, I, you could even take people who grew up in racist families where they're just convinced that this is the way it is. And then one day they're confronted with something that doesn't fit that. And it's, what do they call it? Cognitive dissonance. That's an uncomfortable spot to be. And mm -hmm. I, I would guess that person who got up from the table was feeling it and didn't like the way that felt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Well, so... You got to come to the UCA conference, and you brought your parents with you. I, 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 I was nice of them to join you. Yeah, you know, I had to hog tie them and, you know, haul them along. <laughs> <laughs> it was good to see them. There was, you know, quite a range of ages at this conference, which was very encouraging mm -hmm. to me. I mean, do you remember how many people in your general range you met and got to talk to? I'd say there was probably maybe like 10 or 15 maybe in my age category, depending on what you count my age category as. Young adult, college age, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I saw you guys talk on occasion. I'm like, look at that. There's a whole crew of, quote, kids. You know, <laughs> That's just encouraging for people like me who are like hoping that this takes hold and that we can do more. To see young people at a theology conference is just fantastic. And you were one of those people. And that's, yes. I, I love it. <laughs> It was a really great conference. Just being able to see that many like-minded believers come together and mm -hmm. talk about that was great. Yeah, yeah. So what was your degree in? Uh, my degree was in broadcasting, digital media, and journalism. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> so that leads naturally to the question, what kind of plans do you have going forward? I'm kind of trying to decide, you know, exactly what I want to do. I would really like to eventually branch out into ministry and doing a lot more writing and maybe even some theological things, but also just kind of, you know, focusing on being the hands and feet of Jesus in different scenarios, living out faith through ministry. I'm really into video type stuff as well, being able to, you know, do videos of people, documentaries. Hmm. Um, I'd like to maybe do some international travel with the, you know, different cultures and stuff hmm. and be able to share those things through video and kind of like National Geographic. Oh, cool. Well, if you're traveling the world, we've got a long list of Unitarian Christians who are isolated. So I'll commission you <laughs> to make sure you get to visit with some people and help build more connections. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for taking this time. I pray that your experience gives some people perspective on what it might be like and they can make more informed decisions if they're considering going to a Christian college as well. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed the time here, and thank you for everything that you're doing with the UCA podcast. It's been really cool. All right. That book Hannah mentioned, I found it. Superheroes Can't Save You, Epic Examples of Historic Heresies by Todd Miles. I am very intrigued. I may have to get it, given how clever the idea is but I have another idea I'd like to float to you. Do, 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 do. A book review request. Because this is the slightly less than scholarly Unitarian podcast, and unabashedly so, this seems like the proper place to review Superheroes Can't Save You. I want to know which superhero we are paired with, or heroes even. The whole idea seems delightful and fun. Let me know if that's something that would delight your soul. If you are up for the fun, get the book, read it, and make some good notes. Email me, podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org, and we can make plans. <clears throat> now I fear that with this podcast's massive global reach, that just by suggesting this book, I may create a massive surge of purchases. What if they sell out? Well, 
You're welcome, Todd Miles. Anyhow, it's just an idea. We'll see. A reminder that I'm now putting an index into the show notes with times for the different parts of the show. I love audio, but it can be hard to find things later if you want to go back. So check out the index. Some podcast players, and I do recommend you try a dedicated podcast player if you're looking to do something new, they turn those index time markers into clickables. Just tap and jump right to that moment in the show. Very cool. I'll put indexes in when the interview starts, when the topics change, and I'll put one in when I read a letter or play an audio clip. I think it's helpful. Here, there's an index timestamp right now that will point you right to this next bit so you can come back again and again. Hello, Mark. This is Brandon Russell again. So I recently discovered a weird pseudo-Christian sect. Yeah, they worship Jesus and a monkey. That's because they follow the book of Curios George. (laughs) Thanks, Brandon. I love it. Keep the smiles coming. And can I just add that during my recent travels, Brandon was one of my UCA visits. We had dinner and visited for probably almost four hours, 30 minutes past closing time. (laughs) The folks at the restaurant just did cleaning and let us carry on. Brandon, thank you for that time together. (laughs) Events. We have a men's event and also a women's event in New York this April. June has events in Indiana, Kentucky, and New York. Then July has another women's conference, this one in Illinois. Finally, September has an event in New York. The list is growing. Amanda Dunn has been talking with many people. It isn't slowing down. Thanks, Amanda. I received this note from Susan. Hello, Mark. Thanks for your wonderful podcasts. They are among my favorites. I think I've listened to every one of them. I was recently doing some continuing education for my work as a pharmacist. Though this topic is serious, the descriptions made me smile in light of all I'm learning about the Trinity Doctrine. I know you have a unique sense of humor, so I thought I would pass it along. Program responsibilities include helping identify possible problem patients and physicians. Examples include... Physicians who are prescribing Trinity or Holy Trinity scripts. Trinity scripts are three prescriptions filled in combination, of which one is hydrocodone and one is benzodiazepine and one is a muscle relaxer. The Holy Trinity is the same combination with oxycodone, replacing the script for hydrocodone. (laughs) Susan continues, This Trinity doctrine is everywhere. Blessings in Christ. Susan. (laughs) That's very interesting, Susan. It seems, in this case, they recognized that indeed the Trinity poses a serious problem. (laughs) Last week, the UCA released another video from the 2021 UCA conference, Dr. Stephen Snobelin's historical presentation named Paul Best, 17th Century Biblical Unitarian and Prisoner of Conscience. Things didn't work out to talk to Stephen on the podcast before the video was released, but I hope to do it anyhow, one day soon. We are still working out the details for this year's UCA conference, so I don't have specifics yet. If you were at the last conference, you'll recall we noted that we'll be accepting papers for the theological presentations. If that is something you are interested in, maybe start thinking the ideas through now. We'll be announcing more about that soon. And we are going to expand the conference a bit, including some other sessions at the same time as some of the theological ones. I'm thinking hard about how to incorporate something there that may find its way into this podcast, like maybe a panel discussion or Names of Church Fathers Spelling Bee. Well, maybe. It will be in the autumn again, so keep following along. UCA members, those who join the website UnitarianChristianAlliance.org, not only get to put their spot on the map, they get emails with every post to the website. You'll be notified when more information is available. Hannah Dean, thank you to you and to your parents for being such a good influence. I loved our talk. Oh, one thing you mentioned, 
You did your theology papers stating your beliefs using actual words of Scripture and not Trinitarian language, and it didn't create a problem. That's good advice for others, certainly, but it does make one wonder why that didn't set off alarm bells, something you can ponder as you lie in bed tonight. If you know someone who is considering attending a university like this, they might find this chat with Hannah to be just what they needed. Someone who has gone on before them, cut through the underbrush, survived the dangerous fauna, and lived to tell the tale. Suggest this episode to them. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well. Oh, I did some Googling, and there may be over 100,000 people named Trinity out there. I think there's a chance that one of them is a Unitarian Christian. If you're out there, you've got yourself a Disney Fast Pass to the front of this podcast line.